They have, in this case, we're saying that they have a cottage here that's worth about three hundred thousand dollars. They purchased it for about fifty thousand dollars. They actually are the rare couple that didn't inhabit it. Uh, they have CDs worth about three hundred thousand. And Frank uh, has a, a uh, 401k worth about 500000 So they have total assets of $1,450,000. Their estate plan is very simple right now. That is, when one dies, they want the other one to own the cottage and everything else. And the two of them are going to die. They want everything to be divided equally among the kids. So first, I just wanted to say a few things about estate taxation. I had mentioned when we did this last month that there were some things that I just could not get to. Uh, last month, and that's, these are the things that I wanted to do. One of them is this. Um, if, uh, if one of them inherits everything from the other, then, and the second one dies and they still have assets that are worth a million four hundred fifty thousand dollars, they will, that the estate, before these assets get divided among the kids here in Massachusetts, will pay an inheritance tax of eighty-seven thousand five hundred dollars. Uh, if they, if they are from Massachusetts, if they are from out of state, if they are from out of state, no matter what the estate tax is in that other state, if they are from Florida, for example, which has no estate tax, they will pay a Massachusetts estate tax of $19,500. The, the reason for that is the way Massachusetts decides whether you owe an estate tax here is if you have, if you are a resident here, or if you have tangible, or if you have tangible personal property or real property, either one, here in Massachusetts, then the way that Massachusetts does it is they'll take the entire estate that you have, they'll figure out what you would have owed if you were a Massachusetts resident, in this case $87,500. They'll take that percentage of your assets attributable to the property in Massachusetts, which in this case is about 20%, that's what they're taught, that, that $300,000 is about 20% of the rest of the assets, and they'll charge you an estate tax on that amount. So if you live in a state um, which has an, which does not have an estate tax, or if you live in a state tax in a state that in a state that does, you're going to pay a Massachusetts estate tax of nineteen thousand five. Now, if you pay a state an estate tax in your state, they'll give you a credit for a piece of that in terms of calculating what your final estate tax is. Now, typically, when I have talked to clients about this, I've said, well, you know. Um, on the, other, on the one hand, that's bad news in that you have to pay an estate tax. On the other hand, the thing about property, whether it is a cottage or whether it was real estate here on the island, is that there's a whole other tax, which you're all aware of, it's called the capital gains tax. And the way that tax gets calculated when you sell something is you pay a tax on the difference between basically the sale price and what you bought it for. What you bought it for is called your basis, except if you die owning real estate or other a property that appreciates like that, your basis in that property, your tax basis steps up to your day to death value. That's why typically when you own real estate, it is to your children's advantage to have you hold it until you die so that the basis steps up. So that in this case, remember, remember, the, uh, remember, the, remember the example, um, these folks had bought this cottage for $50,000. It's now worth about three hundred thousand dollars. So, if, and, and it's not their home. So, if they sell it, they have to pay a capital gains tax on the difference, right? Which would be about two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Now, the total capital gains tax in Massachusetts, the total federal and state, is about twenty-five percent. So, they'd be paying a capital gains tax of about seventy, of about thirty-seven, or about sixty-two thousand five hundred dollars. That's twenty-five percent of. $250,000. That's a substantial tax. If, on the other hand, they held the property until they died, uh, then the tax basis of that property would step up to its date of death value so that if the kids then sold the property, they wouldn't pay a capital gains tax on it. So I, I would typically advise folks in these kinds of situations, well, you know, you may want to hold on to the property and have it passed through your estate, you have to pay a small estate tax, but at the same time, when your kids go to sell it, they're going to save a lot of money. Um, the issue, though, is that there is a way out of this. If the property is held by a limited liability company, and, I'm, and, and, and by the way, whenever I go to seminars on tax law, and I start falling asleep, so this is going to be, I'm going to end on the tax piece pretty quickly, but I just want you to get a sense of this. 
Uh, if, you, if this property is owned by a limited liability company, if your cottage were owned by a limited liability company, and it were an out-of-state limited liability company, say it were from Florida, uh, or some other state, wherever you live, um, and it had two or more members, and it, you owned the cottage and died, then for Massachusetts purposes, this cottage would not be Massachusetts property. It would not be, there would not be a Massachusetts estate. You would not pay the Massachusetts estate tax. Ah, but the problem then is, if the, if the property is in a limited liability company and you don't, don't just own it, does the, can you get the, the basis to step up? Well, it turns out you can. You can. So if one of your children were one of those um, uh, owners of the limited liability company, they could cause, through something called a Section 754 election, Internal Revenue Code Section 54 election, they could cause the basis in your cottage to step up to the date of death value. So by using this device, you could eliminate estate taxation in Massachusetts and still guarantee that if your kids, through this LLC, decide that they need to sell the cottage later on, they wouldn't pay capital gains tax on it. So it's advantageous. I don't want to do any more tax stuff. You know, if, there, if, there, if you ever wonder more about that, ask your lawyer, ask me, ask somebody. Now, we're going to talk some more about the issues that we didn't finish with uh, last month. So, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. are the three children. Uh, you may recall that Peter uh, has three wonderful kids. They live in New York State, but he and his wife are not getting along well at all. Uh, so there may be some issues later on. Paul is living in San Diego with his wife and their two children. They love San Diego. They love it so much. And by the way, they even have beaches in San Diego, which means that they don't tend to want to come here as much as the other kids do. So there is this question about, you know, so you know, what should be their interest in the cottage later on? And then Mary, Mary lives here. She lives in, here in Massachusetts. She's kind of, you know, not doing that well, though, financially. She's got two kids. The kids love it, love coming, coming here, right? But the issue is, you know, are they going to want to come? Are, are she going to be able to afford to help pay for the cottage in the longer run? Also, her daughter um, has uh, um, some, has a fairly significant mental disability. So there's an issue there regarding if, the, if her daughter ever inherits a piece of this cottage, what does that mean as far as that daughter's ability to qualify for disability benefits? So she's got, a lot of times folks will come to me and they'll say, well, you know, I've got a very simple estate plan. You know, I just, when I die, I just want to get everything to my, my spouse and then I just want to divide it up among the kids. And, but a lot of times there are issues involved with that. Now we're going to talk about some of those more specific issues later on. But the biggest issue is, just to start off, I'll say, well, what if there's a disagreement between the kids? And they'll say, well, you know, they're just going to work that out, you know, or not, because sometimes the kids don't work it out. Now, we talked about the fact that, that the best time to deal with that or to prevent that is before you're dead, right? Because if the kids are left to figure it out, and especially, then typically they're going to do what you did. They're going to say, well, we're not going to say anything until there's a disagreement. But then when there's a disagreement, that's the worst possible time to try to figure it out. So you're trying to figure these things out before you die. 